Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture and uh, so today I just want to talk a little bit about kind of mobile app design in general. Um, so it's not kind of tied to any specific uh, uh, the framework but we kind of wherever possible we look a little bit of uh, uh, Android, maybe iOS, maybe even Windows Mobile as well. So the agenda what I want to look at today um, is a quick app design overview, a um, little bit about know, knowing your framework, choosing a methodology, um, initial design and action plan, and then desi designing your user interface. So hopefully what this will do is it will help you kind of frame um, your um, uh, building your own app and that you can kind of, hopefully it'll give you some kind of uh, a place to start, it'll kind of focus the mind a little bit and give you a, a kind of a little roadmap on how to um, kind of go from uh, what you think maybe could be the idea through to um, actually getting it implemented, okay? Uh, so to begin, quick overview. So before writing any code, you must ask yourself some fundamental questions. So what is the app's purpose? What are the app's features? What kind of data model will the app use? And is it a universal app? So when we say universal, we mean is it going to run on all devices or is it just going to be just a, um, a phone, that particular mobile device? So again, these are questions you could be asking yourself even now. I know it's quite early on in the module, um, but you could be uh, quite a, a deciding and asking yourself these questions. What do I want my app to do? What do I want? What do I want its features to be? The data model, we'll talk about that in a little bit, bit more detail later on. And then we just we can assume it's just for a phone, but maybe you want to build one for a, a tablet as well. Um, and, and that could be, that's just fine too, okay? So generally, an app that is well-designed has features that users find both appealing, appropriate, and useful. And I've just put together some kind of very familiar um, uh, kind of common apps uh, that um, uh, you may have uh, installed on your own device. So just to, to highlight a couple there, look, we have our Gmail, this is one type of an app. We have Viber, again, another type of an app. This is one here, Executive Assistant, it was, it's called. It's very, very useful for just bringing together uh, on, in one place all your emails, your texts, your messages, whatever. And I just want to show you these two here. We say, for argument's sake, Life Score and um, Ultimate Rugby, this is apps, versus a kind of our minions game okay so the reason i'm highlighting these here is that these are two very different use cases and these are things you need to think about as an app developer as well that would live the likes of life score right which is football scores and again ultimate rugby which would be rugby scores right the user will essentially launch the app check a score and they're gone again five ten seconds max okay whereas with the game they could be playing that for an hour and that obviously has implications on on your battery um, so they, they are things that you just need to be aware of, okay? Um, now, also, uh, design your app with care. So app design does not just mean user interface design, does not just mean code. It begins with some high level information and ideas. You then think about how to best implement these ideas. So at this stage, again, you're just thinking about the idea itself, but it's it, as I said, it's not just about the interface, it's not just about, about the code, it's it, it's a lot more than that, but you you begin with these high level ideas um, about what you want your app to be, what you want it to do, okay? Um, in terms of the frameworks, right, you also need to become familiar with the respective frameworks. So your app depends on the objects you can create with these frameworks. Get to know the framework objects that implement the basic structure of an app um, that serves the building blocks of uh, your data model and the comp compose the unique experience your app presents to the user. So just basically, you might have these great ideas, you need to find out does your framework support these, but as and I'll probably repeat myself again in, the, in the, the, the rest of this video. But any of the apps that you have on your uh, device at the moment and any features that are in those apps are available to you um, uh, within the, 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 the Android framework as well. Um, as with the other apps um, on, on the other kind of mobile devices, the other frameworks as well, like your iOS, your Windows Mobile, okay? So anything you've seen and that you've used, you could in theory implement yourself as well, okay? Um, just a quick look at the frameworks themselves. Uh, we'll come back to this in later, uh, later um, lectures. Um, but that is Android's um, framework, open source framework. There's our Windows Mobile. And finally, over here, we have, um, there's Apple's uh, kind of iOS um, framework. Point to note, it's all layered, okay? A major difference between Android and the rest of them, Apple, uh, is Android is open source. So you can actually swap in and swap out any of those. So if you, 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 you could decide, I don't want to use the standard 
GUI app. I don't want to stand, use the standard graphics. You could actually use different APIs yourself and bring in these third party libraries or whatever you want, which isn't the case um, with uh, iOS. That, that's, it's, it's, it's quite nailed down. So you're kind of limited to what you can use, okay? Um, in terms of methodology, we'll try and follow Scrum, um, which look as an alternative to the waterfall. You're all familiar with Scrum, um, hopefully anyway. Uh, waterfall looks still around, still can be used, but if you think about what we want to do um, with our particular and, and kind of app design in general, um, you uh, what it is, is you're kind of, um, you're building on uh, an initial app and we have kind of these, these iterations that you go through. Um, and it would be kind of useful to, 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 to break it down into that approach so that you identify the features that you want and kind of prioritize those features and then build those in the particular sprints that will be the case and um, kind of this, this kind of agile software approach. Um, so again, you may have come across that yourselves, you may be using it already, but it's a nice one to try and follow uh, for, for uh, kind of app development, okay? So we just have kind of a screenshot there, just like kind of the old, i just go back, there we go. The, the old um, waterfall model, there's your analysis, design, code, integration, testing, and deployment, all done in in separation, kind of one after the other, all right? Whereas with our um, kind of uh, Scrum iterative approach, we do it in different sections. So this could be, this could be the first version of your app with certain features, and you go through the full kind of the full life cycle there, right? And then you can, when you're happy with that, that you move on to the next version. And the next and so on and kind of i'm hoping that's something that you will do yourselves in, in in your app as well okay in terms of just some tools you might want to use there's a nice one there called uh, trello came across this is an example of a coffee mate app that i would have been working on you can it, it's more kind of useful for team um, based um, projects but it can be useful for yourself as a kind of a to do to do list and breaking down what um, what needs to be done so again just at uh, trello.com you can log on there set up a free account and you could kind of break down the different um, uh, elements to your app and the different features that and kind of uh, kind of the process that you need to go through. Okay, now where to start? So you do your initial design. Okay, a good app starts with an idea that is expanded to more fully featured product description. Early in the design phase, it helps to understand just what you want your app to do, not how you will do it. Write down the set of high level features that would be required to implement your idea. Prioritize those features as we can just discuss there based on what you think your users will need. Do a little research into the frameworks again, which we touched on um, so that you understand its capabilities and how you might be able to use them to achieve your goals. So again, we're just talking about don't focus on on how you're going to do it because um, you will learn that through the module. This is more about thinking about what you want to do and then find out, do a little bit of research into the frameworks just to confirm that you can actually do what you want to do. And going back to that example that I gave, the rule of thumb, if you've seen it on an app, you can you can do it yourself, okay? Okay, so there we go. Now, um, in terms of uh, your initial design, there's some um, kind of uh, nice tools out there, kind of smashingapps.com, justinmind.com, proto.io. These are all open source kind of free sites that you can use to, to, to sketch out some rough interface designs on paper to visualize how your app might look. And again, all you might need at this stage is your simple pen and paper. Um, uh, you, you, you could start with that and then when you feel yeah you know what this is what i might want it to look like then you can move on to some of those tools but there's loads in there really nice and can give the user um, a feel for how your app is going to look and how it's going to function right? and kind of the screens that you can navigate through and you don't need to have any code behind it at all that's the beauty of all these tools so again just a few links there that you can kind of uh, visit um, at a later date okay uh, just to talk a little bit more about your initial design. The goal of your initial design is to answer some very important questions about your app. The set of features and the rough design of your interface help you think about what will be required uh, later when you start writing code. At some point, you need to translate the information displayed uh, by your app into a set of data objects. So this is kind of getting a little bit closer to the actual coding now and the development process. And then similarly, the look of your app has an overwhelming influence on the choices you must make when implementing your user interface code. So again, are you going to use simple menus? Could it be a nav drawer you're going to use? These are all, um, uh, points and, and things you need to be aware of and will determine 
um, kind of the look and feel of your app. So doing your initial design on paper rather than on a computer gives you the freedom to come up with answers that are not limited by what is easy to do. So you're not tying yourself down to, oh God, how am I going to use an app drawer? You're going to design it out first, spec it out first. And if it, if you think that's the way it looks and, and, and that's the way you want it to be, um, then you can actually go delve a little bit deeper into it, okay? Um, <coughs> I found some nice, there's a nice link here, a nice article on that fullstop.com. It's um the, the kind of, the, the, it's quite a long article. The link is there at the bottom of the, the, the page there. But the general thrust of it is don't design for yourself, design for your user. So designing for mobile is certainly very subjective. And usually the process of designing something is one of the trickiest as well as time consuming parts of any project. Everyone who is a part of the project has a different point of view. And this is the reason why there are a lot of opinions and it also varies from individual to individual. So this basically the article kind of identifies three important ways for making effective mobile design for users, okay? So the first one there, keep the needs of the customer in mind. So just there's no point in you plowing ahead yourself and what you think is this brilliant app that you're developing for someone else and you haven't kept those, those customers' needs in mind. So you need to just, um, kind of get some feedback from the people your tar your target audience the people you want you think you're out are going to use your app get some feedback from them and kind of factor that into the design process so design for your users that was the main point there uh, the next one was a good initial brief kind of experience designer so if you have strong foundations to begin with if you have a good design um, it should lend itself to a good implementation so getting the design right um, is another kind of important way to make it effective mobile design and the last one there, identify people who match your target audience. So again, show it around family, friends, um, even your the, your your, your um, students in the class with you. Just try kind of find out what something that you might think is a fantastic color mix uh, may not be the case and, 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 and may not be to, to everyone's taste. So the more people you show it to, specifically your target audience, the better chance you have of get finding the right kind of color scheme the right layouts um, and all the rest of it so the, the, the kind of the takeaway point there is show it around let people see what you're what, what you're developing okay so uh, behind it all don't design for yourself design for your users okay um, now just the next step so kind of you're moving beyond that right you're moving beyond the initial design phase now we're looking at kind of creating an action plan here okay so iOS and Android assumes that most apps are built using the MVC or model view controller design pattern, although MVP or model view presenter now is becoming a lot more popular, right? Therefore, the first steps you can take towards achieving this goal are to choose approaches for the data and view portions of your app, okay? So I've, I've, we go into it in a little bit more detail in the rest of the slides, but the, 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 kind of the general kind of three points to make are, number one, choose a basic approach for your data model. So how is your data going to be structured, okay? Decide whether you need support from framework specific elements. So is, is, is there specific features that you want in your app that are, are supplied by uh, the framework, okay? And then choose a particular approach for your user design. So again, deciding on how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, and, and what the kind of the, the UX, the user experience is, is, is going to be, okay? Um, so to go into a little bit more detail, so choosing a basic approach for a data model, you can kind of go into it in detail yourself there. I'll just kind of quickly go through them. You have your existing data model code, you have your custom objects data model code, and you have your structured data model code. So the existing data model means you can actually leverage some code um, and some data model that you've used maybe in previous projects. And that, that could be just brought straight in, okay? Um, especially if it's Java uh, or if you've done it in Kotlin, okay? And that would be tied to specifically to Android. We have our custom objects data model. So a custom object typically combines some simple uh, data, so strings and numbers and dates, etc., with the business logic needed to manage that data and ensure its consistency. So you would go off and you'd write this, develop this custom object yourself within your, your, your application. And the last one there, a structured data model. This is kind of, if, if you're looking at a database backend, so you can use core data or SQLite, or now there's rooms now as well within Android. Um, so these are kind of the, the three main different uh, type of approaches you can take when deciding on how to manage your data okay you can use existing data model that you already have you can build a new one um, or if it's going to be quite structured you can work with um sorry uh, you can work with a structured data model as well and, and, and have your database back in okay um, second point there, decide whether you need support from framework specific elements. So each framework will have a set of elements components which you are free to use and integrate into your own app. 
um, or even customized to do a specific job. Get to know how these components work and how they can make your app more useful and user friendly. So the example we have there is a very common one is maps. Okay, if you want to have maps in your app, get to know how those components work, find out how to use maps within your Android app, within your iOS app or whatever. There's great tutorials out there, there's loads of examples. Android Studio itself even has a, um, a map project that you can build using wizards and will actually have a functioning map um, developed for you. Okay, so the, the, the point we're just making there is, um, if, if there's particular, particular components you wanna use, find out Number one, does the framework support them? Number two, then how to actually go and use them, okay? A um, little bit more detail there on, on choosing the approach for your user interface. Most of the time, again, there's a bit of detail there which you can read through yourselves, but most of the time, what we're talking about is the building block, block approach. So you will use what I like to call the widgets. So this is the easiest way to create your UI. Um, and it's a, it's a, to assemble your UI from existing view objects. So there's all, there's all these widgets available to you within all these different particular um, frameworks and these IDEs. And uh, with an Android, there's this lovely palette that you can drag and drop out buttons. You can drag and drop a map element that we just saw there now. Um, you can have rating bars, you can have, um, or progress bars, um, uh, loads of different like text fields, buttons, whatever you want. Um, and generally 90% 90, 90 of the time, that's the way you'll do it. Now, saying that, if you need to do something a little bit more advanced and you're looking at maybe 2D, 3D graphics, that's where you would maybe, the basic stuff might be enough for you. So you'd, you'd need to look at the OpenGL, that ES-based approach there. So that's where, if it's sophisticated rendering, just kind of heavy processing on, on, on the um, the screen and have, uh, quite quite frequent screen updates, you might need to bring in these, the, these other particular libraries. Games is a very simple example there. Okay, so if you're planning on using building a game, um, you might need to look at something like OpenGL um, and beyond the basic building block approach, okay? Um, so just some screenshots there of the UI builders. Uh, just highlight there for you now. So there's our, our um, uh, Windows, there's our Xcode, and then finally there's our, our Android Studio. And you can see yourself, they all look quite similar. So you can see it here in Android Studio, which is what we'll be focusing on. There's a kind of a project, all the physical, the, 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 the source code, your kind of, your, your, um, uh, Kotlin Java code and all these resources, all these drawables, and we'll talk about that in more in, 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 in due course. And then we have the XML, which represents the layout. So that's that there is actually represented by um, XML, and you can view it then in text, like we have there, or in design view, which would, would give you that there. Okay, so the, 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 the ID is constantly evolving, constantly improving. Um, so it's it's a, it's a really very very good one to work with. Okay. Um, in terms of starting the app creation process, so this is kind of you've you've gone beyond that and you've had your basic uh, idea, you've decided on um, the the data mod, you've decided on the, what the UI might look like. Do we need any specific components? So now, when you start to actually code your app, you should have answers to the following questions, right? So number one, again, bit of detail, you can kind of run through it yourselves. I'll give you a quick version there. The, the three, three, four questions to ask yourself, what is the basic interface style of your app? Do you want to create a universal or a targeted app? Do you want your app to use storyboards or navigation? And finally there, what do you want to use uh, for your data model? So this is kind of just bringing together what we've been looking at in the previous set of slides. So what is the basic interface style of your app? Is it going to be um, uh, very basic with menus, is it going to be a lot more sophisticated, um, kind of using uh, using nav drawers or bottom navigation. All that determines the type of initial kind of uh, app you will you will build and, um, uh, um, sorry, no, and um, kind of where you want to go with it, okay? And you can always change the user interface later, but choosing the most appropriate template first makes starting your project much easier. So there's all these wizards available to you. So if you know beforehand, yes, I want an app drawer, there's one there, I want a split screen, there's one there, I want bottom navigation, there's one there too. Um, as I say, you can go back and change it, but it, it can be a little bit tricky. So having this, uh, been able to answer that, question will make your life a lot easier. Second one there, do you want to create a universal or targeted app? Again, that will have implications on um, designing the app itself, that if it's only if it's a targeted app, if it's only for a particular mobile device, you only have to design for that particular size screen. If it's universal, 
a little bit more you have to consider okay um do you want to you do you want your app to use storyboards and navigation this is more kind of design or designer centric um and uh, developer facing as they say um and there, there, there are newer features within android uh, within android studio and ios where you it's like your 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 storyboarding in um uh kind of uh, storytelling and in the movies that you can actually lay out what screens you want to go from from screen a to screen b to screen c and you can build in transitions you can build in navigation um, so if you want to have that there you again you need to choose those particular options from the start as well okay and the final one there what do you want to use for your data model we've kind of discussed this already some types of app lend themselves naturally to a structured data model which makes them ideal candidates for using core data or sqli so again if it's um, most data driven apps these days have some kind of a persistent back end which a lot of the times is a database um, and so that's kind of qu quite common approach there but it doesn't have to be you could actually be re be re retrieving data from your, your mongodb in a, a kind of a json format so again do doesn't have to be as structured as you want but if you have all if you can answer that question beforehand we'll make the development um of your app much easier okay um starting the app creation process okay so the following phases of app development are quite common so writing your app's primary code adding support for app state changes creating including the resources needed to support your app and i have that highlighted and i'll, I'll talk about it in a minute um, as needed implementing any app specific behaviors um, that are relevant adding advanced features that make your app unique and then carrying out some basic performance tuning for your app and, and can and then you kind of do that um in a, this iterative process so you kind of you, you'll write some code you'll build in some functionality add in some resources and then go back and do it all again but the reason i've highlighted that point there creating including the resources needed to support your app um, the example there will be we say you have a nice color scheme in mind we say you've come across some nice buttons but we, we you're even thinking of designing your own buttons um and, and nice fonts and layouts and all the rest of it if you have that in place beforehand it will just make the process your app development process much more fluid um, in that you you don't have to keep breaking away from development and going off and finding new images and new new um, deciding on new colors and all the rest of it if you have your resources in place beforehand it'll just make things so much easier for you okay um, now what about the user interface so again so some screenshots there of the kind of all the major players okay so your app's user interface is everything that the user can see and interact with so following your platform's ui design guidelines is a tried and trusted way to increase metrics like user retention and customer satisfaction it makes it easier for your users to learn how to use the application to the fullest extent um, as quickly and as intuitively as possible be mindful of the fact that the respective ui frameworks may use different widgets to do the same similar thing and position uh, user options differently so i suppose what we're saying there is the uh, app development even it's still relatively new but like it's we say it's 10 it since 2007 so we're talking you know it's, it's it's been around over a decade now okay so there are guidelines there in place that will inform the developer and these are laid down by google and would be the case by apple as well on what best colors to use with what the particular fonts the size of fonts again to just a whole suite of ui design guidelines so they you should be checking those and conforming to those as best you can because that will obviously make your app look like um a, a proper android app a proper ios app okay so it's all part it it it, it, it it's um uh, gives confidence to the user to use your app because it feels and looks like a proper android app okay so those guidelines are there to be followed okay um now also because this is a kind of a general uh, set of slides on on a video on, on mobile app design if you can if you consider where the widgets are laid out they're different in ios and android so again just be kind of mindful of that um if you're developing for for, for both platforms as the case may be okay a um, little bit more there make sure you are familiar with the relevant design guidance that they, the look and feel of your app is consistent with the target platform it's kind of like what i was just talking about also you need to know the respective ui frameworks and hierarchies and how they assist you when building your your user interface now again it's not great to see there now do i have it on the next slide i do yeah it's a bit bigger on the, this slide here so what i'm what i'm kind of highlighting here is just show you there now hang on sorry this would be kind of like the if you want to if, if you the the, the 
the type of interaction between these different components within uh, Android. And if you look at it here, it's similar in iOS and it's similar in Windows. We all have this view component, which is basically all the widgets anything the user sees, which is interacts with this thing called the activity, which can in turn interact with this thing called a content provider um, or a service as the case may be. And then we have these broadcast receivers. These are all components. These are all things we will look at in more detail later on. But you as a developer, you kind of just need to become aware of all these, okay? And just to kind of highlight the fact of how complex and how deep, I suppose, for want of a better term, the whole um, environment is, if we just show you in the next slide, right? Actually, sorry, yeah, there we go, right? That one view element, right? That's one particular component. Within the hierarchy, within Android, this is the Android view component. Look, we have a view group. We have a particular text view or an analog clock. Look, there's our progress bar, which in turn can be an app seek bar. We have an image view widget, right, which in turn extends from an image button or quick contact badge. We have that that's the, from the progress bar. You actually get your rating bar as well and your seek bar. So and all, all these are separate classes themselves. So all extending from that one individual component. And that is only one small part of Android. There are hundreds and hundreds of classes um, within the whole hierarchy. Uh, now, it's virtually impossible for you to know them all. So the best you can do is once you've decided on your um, design, how they look and feel, and you've checked, you've decided on what kind of components you want to use, you look up and you research the particular components that you want to use to solve your particular problem. And then if, if a new feature is to be added and a new problem um, presents itself, you then do your research to find out, find out what components are there within the framework to help me solve that particular problem, okay? Um, so in summary, I suppose, right, we've had a quick look at our app, an app design overview. Just know a little bit about your own framework. Choose a particular methodology. Um, you then go and build, talk about your initial design and your action plan. And then you go, you can go ahead and design your user interface. But that, you know, a lot of that can be iterative if we go back to our methodology. Do, uh, d decide on, on what your, your, the particular features are, prioritize those, and then follow those through to completion to actual kind of user testing and then go back and do it all again, okay? Um, in terms of some references, there's some stuff on, on iOS. There's a, a good few there that you can, you can check out. Here's ones for ourselves with the Android that we'll be looking at. The Android developer site, it, as I said, it's the official site. It's the go-to place. It's just a wealth of information up there. You, you should be looking at the, the design guidelines as well uh, and your UI kind of conventions for Android. Um, and then I kind of give up on Windows because uh, it's not much of a, it's not, it's not a bit a, a, as big a player as the others, but there is a little link there for your kind of your Windows 10 development if you want to have a look at it, okay? So other than that, um, if you have any questions, you can uh, get me on Slack. Uh, but other than that, um, thanks for listening and uh, goodbye. Hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, set of lectures, which will be involved in the first part of um, introducing Android, okay? So the way I've broken it down is as follows. We have a uh, background in history, uh, latest features, the mobile OS war, as I like to call it, the finer details, setting up the environment, and then Android apps versus uh, iPhone apps. So what I want to do today is uh, look at the following. So we'll have a quick little, uh, <clears throat> quick look at uh, the background and history of Android. We'll look at some of the latest features and the latest versions of Android that are now available. Um, just make some comparisons between the, the, the kind of the, the main competing operating systems, which is um, our um, Android and uh, our iOS. And then the, the, this part two, look a little bit more detail into kind of under the hood and the kind of the structure of Android. And then some of the stuff that you need to know about in terms of setting up the environment. And then finally, again, just a comparison in terms of kind of installation usage of Android apps versus uh, iPhone apps. OK, so to begin with, a little bit of background. So Android is a comprehensive open source platform designed for mobile devices. It's championed by Google and owned by the Open Handset Alliance, the OHA, right? And this is, I have said this, uh, the next slide will kind of give you a breakdown of a lot of those companies. But essentially it's 84 companies um, that all kind of got together to, um, and I suppose the, the goal of that alliance, right, is to accelerate innovation in mobile and offer consumers a richer, less expensive and better mobile experience. And again, that was in, 
kind of um, competition to uh, and a kind of response to uh, Apple coming out with their their iPhone and again that was back in November 2007 okay so some of those companies if you have a quick look at them you can see it here we've kind of broken down into our mobile operators so I'd be kind of familiar with again there, 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 there's a very American slant on this but you would be familiar with some of these look uh, Vodafone there's your telecom kind of uh, would American uh, Sprint there's some kind of China Telecom as well um, China Mobile there's another one okay uh, in terms of the software companies so you should definitely be kind of familiar with some of these so there's obviously the big one uh, or Google but we've also got eBay in there as well um, we have um, kind of uh, some other companies there kind of myriad they're more American type stuff um, uh, you can see it there from uh, we have our kind of commercialization companies there again uh, this again because it's kind of generally started in America a lot of these will be uh, American based companies but if we look at some of the, the semiconductor companies from a, the, the hardware point of view we'll be familiar with those look ARM and Intel two of the big ones there and um, if we look at the handset manufacturers themselves I guarantee you if you have an Android device chances are it's um, one of these uh, companies here these manufacturers are kind of Samsung we have our LG we have uh, Huawei there is a big one um, even look Lenovo there kind of ASOS more familiar maybe with um, PCs and laptops but again all part of this alliance uh, they're actually Sony there's another one there again okay uh, so again as I said all part of this alliance to uh, just come together to 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 um, kind of promote this this um, notion of mobile use uh, building mobile devices but just uh, kind of cheaper and uh, kind of to try and advance the whole area okay so if we just continue on there a little bit more in the background uh, so again Android along with iOS has and continues to revolutionize the, uh, revolutionize the mobile space now this is an important point unlike iOS however Android is an open platform and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on that separates the hardware from the software that runs on it so this allows for a much larger number of devices to run the same applications and create a much richer ecosystem uh, for developers and for consumers so if you think about it Apple they um, have uh, everything is wrapped up in the one device both the hardware and the software is all developed by the same company um, all bundled up in the same device and again not that many devices if you think about it there's you just have your, your iPhones your iPads now obviously more recently they've gone into kind of wearable devices but on the whole um, it's uh, you know it, it's those small number of devices whereas in the Android world um, there's a much more I suppose you, you, you could argue it's more fragmented and we will talk about that again in more detail but if you look at, at the breakdown here we have again we have our wearable stuff phones and tablets as before you have your Android boxes you can have your Android TV so a lot of, a lot of TVs run um, uh, Android as the OS it's in your cars okay with our uh, with our Android Auto we also have Android things which is an, uh, kind of something that I find I think is quite interesting in terms of uh, it, uh, having a smart house and having your devices be able to talk to each other and you be able to monitor those devices so things like your fridge uh, your washing machine you can actually keep track of all those and a lot of this kind of this android in in those elements and we've also got kind of the, the, the ndk as well that the, the native development kit if you need to do some very kind of low level programming okay um now as we will see later on you might think that's an advantage but some people could argue that this fragmentation is actually um, is not a good thing. But as I said, we will discuss that in, in, in due course. OK, a um, little bit more on it. So it's designed for mobile devices. So when designing Android, the team looked at which mobile device constraints were likely not going to change for the foreseeable future. So things like your battery, the battery performance, that's not going to get massively big, bigger anytime soon. Um, again if you're if you're getting more than a day out of your battery you're doing very well um, in general the small size of those devices means that they'll always be limited in terms of memory and speed uh, again compare your 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 laptop and the memory that you would have in space in a laptop versus your phones but now th that is changing with some of the later phones now uh, the kind of the, the, the amount of ram is starting to increase and is nearly comparable <clears throat> with what laptops would have been maybe say 10 years ago um now, however, a device's screen size, its resolution and its chipset may vary, vary considerably. So these are all constraints that have been taken into consideration 
um, throughout the platform and our constraints and things you as a developer need to be aware of as well. So just to kind of come back to the battery for, 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 for a, a, a second. If you're building an app that could be heavy on battery, like if, it's, if it has location awareness in it, every time you check your location, a little bit of the battery is used up. So these are things you, you, you would need to be aware of that if your app is going to be checking the battery quite often or checking the location quite often, what kind of a hit does it have on, on the battery and battery performance? So, you know, issues just to be aware of, okay? Um, in terms of the, of the versions, right? Um, way back when, just highlight something there now. So we had our kind of Android cupcake, Android 1.5, 1.6, that's back in, in 07, 08. Um, um, and if you notice, these here, uh, 1.5, year two, 2.1, they, they all came out um, within five to six months of each other. There was a, a very quick um, uh, kind of, what would you call it, kind of movement and, and re new releases of newer versions because the, the, the landscape was changing so quickly. Now, thankfully, that has slowed down a little bit. Like from, from a developer's point of view, every time a new version comes out, uh, it's the SDK changes, which means you have to go and ch make sure that your app is still compatible. And th these are issues we will talk about later on again. Um, so but back in the early days of Android uh, development, the developers themselves were, were, were kept on their toes, essentially, because th there was so many versions coming out so quickly. But thankfully, that is slowed now. And, ge and generally, you get one, maybe one a year, um, kind of the, the betas, there could be kind of a six month um, from beta to final release. So the developers get an opportunity to work on the beta versions while the users are still on on, on kind of a, a version behind. Um, one point to note though, if you look at all the, the versions, Cupcake, Donut, Eclair there, up to Android 4, there were Ice Cream Sandwich, then even the later versions that might, it might be on your phone at the moment, your Marshmallow, version seven, Nougat there, Oreo, look, and even Android Pie all have uh, one thing in common, which I'll come back to now in a minute. But as it stands, the version at the moment, the latest version is, was, um, uh, or sorry, is now referred to as a Q or is Android 10, <clears throat> which is, a, is also from a developer's point of view, we're knowing about, which is a, our API 29, the API level. And these are things we will, um, developers need to know about, which we'll talk about in a minute. So that was released officially as of September 3rd, there, 2019, okay? So to look at some of the highlights for this version 10, okay, so we have the official release date there, September 3rd, 2019, and uh, the first beta there, uh, March 13th, so roughly again, around a six month um, uh, turnaround time. Uh, and this is what I was alluding to earlier there. For the first time ever, um, uh, it won't be named after a sweet treat or dessert. So again, we're going with version numbers from now on. Uh, so it's going to be an uh, kind of Android 10, even though it's temporarily been referred to as Q, but it's going to be Android 10. Then we're going to have Android 11 and etc. The main reason being that a number is more relatable globally than um, a, a kind of a letter or even been named after a treat. And an example there I can give you is that initially, Android KitKat was going to be named Key Lime Pie, but again, that's more of an American thing, not as um, uh, as relatable. So a decision was made to make it uh, stick with numbers, um, which is strangely enough, similar to their, their uh, kind of main rivals. So you can see why going with version numbers is is um, kind of the, 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 the best way to go with it, okay? Um, just another point there, rolled out for Google Pixel range, so uh, some other OEMs, right, Huawei, OnePlus, LG, Nokia, and that generally, that's what happens, that they, when they come out with the, the latest version, it, it's can't, it can't, and we'll talk about this later on again, can't be pushed out onto all devices um, immediately, unlike iOS, and it's another kind of thing we need to talk about later on. Um, but uh, the version 10, what they, what Google generally do is push it out onto their kind of some fl some flagship um, devices like the Google Pixel range and then other um, kind of uh, manufacturers there as well, like, as I said, Huawei, OnePlus and, and so on and so forth. So many improvements and updates that fall into the three main categories. There are innovation, security and privacy and uh, digital well-being. OK, but as I mentioned, the next version 
is going to be Android 11 and this is just taken from the uh, official developer docs there so if you want if you want to go and kind of try it out and start pulling it down you can um, uh, download it online and start working on it well before it's going to end up on any actual devices okay uh, in terms of uh, some of what's in, what's in it again this is taken from the um, official uh, developer docs that they have so there's kind of some behavior changes there so the system changes that may affect your app when it's running on android 11 so we can go in and see some of those things we've got uh, links to privacy features there and then there's some new kind of the, the the new features and some new apis um, that they're bringing in so you can see there apis for 5g g sorry uh, sharing connectivity media there's that um the the, the native um uh, uh, api which is kind of to do with machine learning and uh, all of the ai stuff again type and bit on biometrics there so it's getting quite advanced and as all these new versions of android come out they're just bringing in w um, uh, a lot more features and which again kind of highlights that this how important backward compatibility comes or, or becomes should i say okay um so when you when you as a developer these are again things you need to be aware of you might be you might be uh, wanting to develop in android 11 but if the devices that you're going to push it onto might support it uh, this could uh, kind of flag and, and not make certain features available and again these are all all, all um uh, things we will we'll discuss in, in later sections okay uh, in terms of the timeline for the, this version so we can see there uh, originally started development back in february um uh, it's final release there in june um uh, kind of the end of june pushing into, into july so depending on, on how things are going maybe the coronavirus has, has an impact on this who knows we will we, we'll find out in due course i guess um uh, but again, depending on on and when when you're viewing this video, uh, we we may still be in um, beta releases. We may be in a, a final version. Okay. Uh, now, just to talk a little bit about API levels. Okay. Uh, I suppose, as I mentioned this uh, before, and this is kind of more relevant to um, a developer. So. Uh, Generally, we have the version number of Android that's on your device. So again, could be five, could be six, could be seven, could be ten, even if you if you have a, some of the latest phones and some of the the Google phones themselves, right? But what's of more concern to the developer is the particular API level. Okay, so um, uh, as an application developer, you will you will want to make sure that you know which API level your application is targeting in order to run. That API level will determine which device can and cannot run your application so um, you need that's where this backward compatibility comes in if you're minimum if you when you're building your app and through android studio if you target say for argument's sake version 7 um, as your minimum target that means that any device not running 7 and above will not be able to run your device so you need to make sure that you target um, a, a, a version an API level that will support as many devices as you want to. Now, the downside of that is that the lower API level you pick, the more backward compatibility you need and the bigger your APK becomes because there's all these extra backward compatibility libraries have to be bundled up in your APK, which is what the, the user would download onto their phone. So there's, there's a bit of thought from a developer's point of view can needs to go into um, choosing the, the 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 correct API, okay. Um, just th those figures there, you can see there. Um, that was back in May, um, uh, May 7, twenty nineteen. They would have they've recently go um, Google, sorry, have recently changed how they kind of work out these figures. So I'll, I'll show you some some more more up to date figures now in a minute, okay. But again, that's back in May, sorry, back in May 20, 2019 So just to kind of highlight something there, if you if you look at that there, over ver between six and eight. It's quite a big chunk of uh, the distribution. So that's basically saying, if I just show you the next graph now, right? We're basically saying here that nearly two thirds of all devices out there, as of May the 7th, 2019, are running either Ario, Nougat or Marshmallow, right? Which is that six, seven um, or eight. So if you were de wishing to develop um, uh, an, Andro uh, an Android app, if you target it from six and above, you're going to be getting at least two thirds of all the devices out there. And again, still having access to some of those those features that are, are, are in the later versions of Android, okay? If you look at it there again, if you look at, at version nine there at the bottom, right, see it there? At, that, at the particular time, 
that was only looking covering about 10%. So if you if your minimum SDK, your sorry, your minimum API level was 28, you're only going to be able to target 10 roughly around 10% of the devices out there. So again, these are kind of questions you need you need to ask yourself as a developer and um and, and do I need to maybe target a lower API to be able to get more more uh, uh the market and my device or my app on more devices that are out there, okay? Um now, as I said, it's changed a little bit. So what what the way Android uh, and or, and Google uh, kind of try and help you along on choosing a minimum SDK is as follows: when you are within Android Studio and you're developing and creating a new project, right? What it does is it'll prompt you here. It'll, it'll default to whatever version of Android you would have installed. So here in this example, we have Android 10, and what it's telling us is if you see it there highlighted. 8.2% of devices if we specify a minimum SDK um, uh, of Android 10. Now that could be great for development purposes, but again, if it's actually for 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 um, kind of going live and trying to get your app out there, out, out into the world, you're really limiting yourself by targeting 10 as the minimum SDK. So maybe you should be picking a lower module. Now there's an option there to say, help me choose. So if, if we actually do choose that, this is what we're presented with. So what you can see here is, right, they've changed it a little bit, just to show you there now. They now have the, the figures they use are cumulative distribution, okay? So if you can see their backup, look, if, uh, if you're looking at uh, 4.1, right? We're talking 99.8. So essentially they're saying 99.8, percent of the devices the android devices that are still actively being used um, have uh, at least uh, 4.1 and above okay um, but if we take it to and if we look at the high, what i've highlighted android 10 at the moment that's saying there's only 8.2 devices out there so again perfect for development maybe not so much for um uh, trying to trying to get from a commercial point of view okay uh, if we highlight version 6 84 nearly 85 percent so if you were to pick six as your minimum sdk you're going to be and uh, your your api you're going to be guaranteed at least 85 well just under 85 percent of devices out there would be able to run your app so that's that's a fairly big chunk of the market okay um so again just something to be aware of when you're um building an app and if you if you think you might want to be actually going to um, push this app up onto the play store okay uh, just to talk a little bit about adoption rates and again this was this what we're talking about here is the the the, the, the percentage of um how quickly and how many users out there would update to the, the latest version of the os as it becomes available okay so uh, uh, in general adoption uh, traditionally uh, android adoption traditionally lags behind apple because apple can make its latest ios available for all users at once because it makes all the hardware and the software so again anyone who has an ios device they're probably aware that y you might get a notification to say ios 13 is available and within three days it it's it's more or less forced onto your phone the same doesn't happen with um uh, uh with android because it's a lot more fragmented it's you have different manufacturers different network providers so um uh, with diff slightly different versions of android so it all depends on your unless you've actually got a google device like we saw there in the previous set of slides unless you've actually got a google phone or some of those oems um, you won't be getting the latest version anytime soon okay um uh so we can that kind of that's what we're talking about there now to just look at it in a in a, a graphical sense okay uh, again these are the, the 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 latest kind of um kind of stats i could find latest graphics i could find at the time so this is that was back in october right 2019 and again just to compare it to our may 7th 29th so trying to get it some way comparable okay if we look at it here for ios 12 41 ios 13 is 50 percent okay so again that was back in october so that's the, that at the time that's the the the, the latest version has 50 percent right over here right look at their percentage here right android pi right very small we even saw it ourselves with, with, with say with um if we compare android 10 if we just go back a couple of slides right there's our android 10 right We've only got 8.2 percent so there's a that's a there's a massive difference between the adoption rates for um android and uh and ios okay 
and even back in the at the the the, the worldwide um, developer conference for for Apple, right? The CEO Tim Cook, right, was keen to point out Apple's latest numbers are in stark contrast to the latest offerings from and again those other guys. That's the way. That's what you actually. That's a quote. That's a, that's a direct quote, right? So if we look at our comparisons here, again, just Android nine. 10% iOS 12 85% and as far as I know that 85% happened in the space of four to five days in less than a week every device out there every iOS uh, um, uh, iOS device out there was running version 12 um, sorry 85% of them was running version 12 in comparison to the latest version of time Android um, 10 uh, 10% again all down to the fact that Android is a lot more fragmented and uh the we have different manufacturers with different devices um or with kind of uh kind of different uh different requirements okay so just some from a developer again something just to be aware of okay now i have some what i I think myself are some interesting graphics okay if we look at some comparisons here okay so if we look at this one here right so which countries prefer what again this is based on the third quarter 2019 um globally this you can see this quite a stark difference between your iOS and your Android. Okay, so if we see it there, look, majority of North America all iOS, where predominantly South America is all Android. And again, if we see it there, look, Android, uh, massive of there, um, of Russia, um, East, East, Eastern Europeans, um, uh, even at the Europe as well. So you can see it there. Um, no figures for Africa really, just a small few bits. But again, the bit the the data that they could um collate, so if we're our South Africa there, um all Android again, whereas they're in Australia, predominantly iOS. Now, I would argue that's down to basically money, and it's it's an economic choice. Uh, but again, I thought I, I found it quite interesting. If we look at our our kind of market share versus app revenue here, right? Again, some comparisons some of the, the, mo the most recent charts I could find, right? If we look at 25th, there's our there's the graph there, we have 2015 versus 2019. Look at it there, in 2015 versus 2019 for Android, we're up in the 80s, right? And this is market share now, mind, right? All right so think about, mar this is market share, iOS down around 15% and the rest of them there, not really worth talking about. Whereas for app revenue, right? On the Play Store, so roughly there, look, 11 billion versus 22. And then it's even a bigger gap in 2019. It's even bigger again, the comparison between your Play Store and your App Store. So even though Android has a much, much larger market share, it's actually only making half the money. And your Apple and your Apple devices, uh, it, its revenue is over twice the size okay so um again some kind of interesting um kind of uh, facts there okay another one there from a developer's point of view just comparing there our app store is more lucrative for app makers so again if if you're if if, if you're looking if you're in app development maybe um android or sorry ios is actually a little bit more lucrative than um uh, than android right but Again, on the flip side, the market share is massive. There's a massive difference. So you might be able to make more money, but you might there, there might be less opportunities for Android developers out there because of the of the market share. Okay. Um, some other some other graphs there in it to follow up. I have some some very interesting graphs. Right. Well, I think they're very interesting anyway. Hope you do too. Okay. So if we look at this one here, right. This is in 2019. Okay, so if we look at some of this, I, I thought these were great. Um, if we look at how much spent online, nearly a, this this isn't with it. This is a minute now, sixty seconds. Okay, so we have nearly a million dollars spent. Look at your Netflix, nearly seven hundred thousand uh, thousand uh, hours, three point eight million searches. Right in terms, look text there over eighteen million text sent. App downloads is an interesting one, nearly four hundred thousand app downloads. Right. And if we look at our, our um, uh, what would you call it there? I suppose if look, we have Giphy, look in terms of the messages with, with Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, 41.6 million messages in the space of 60 seconds there, right? Not only there, look, 
1.4 million swipes on Tinder. A lot of people not happy. Um, uh, tweets, nearly nearly 90,000 tweets. Okay, and an Instagram, right? 347,000 there. Right now, what I find really interesting is if we look at the 2020 figures. Okay, so if we look at this here, big jump up there. Right, look at look at uh, some of the very interesting ones there. Look at our Instagram. We went from three four seven to six nine, nearly nearly doubled in the space of uh, uh, twelve months in terms of Instagram. Right, same. Oops, sorry. Same with um, Twitter. Look at Twitter, twenty nineteen, eighty seven and a half thousand, nearly two hundred thousand. Uh, in terms of, I suppose this this, this is a new. Relatively new, I suppose. Look at TikTok, right? Fourteen thousand downloads every sixty seconds. Look at our our money spent online again. We're up to over 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 a million dollars now. Okay, um, again, all in sixty seconds. So the time I've been talking to you now, there's what two three million after been spent online, which is I think is is pretty pretty um. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, from from a, a developer's point of view. Okay, that there's a lot of money being spent online out there, and everything we do. If you think about the, the your your mobile phone and device, it's not just for making calls anymore. You could you can use your device to order dinner, and that dinner could you could be on the bus, and that dinner could be at your door, uh, um, uh, and be delivered by the time you get home. You can turn on your heating. You can you can check to see. Uh, how secure or not your house is through kind of cameras and secure security feeds um, again all on your device all on your mobile phone okay so your the uh, kind of mobile phone and the, the mobile world ha- has really shaped and has changed how we live and um, and I think a lot of these kind of statistics are are, are, are very interesting okay um, I think that kind of oh yeah actually sorry there's, there'll be a video here it's a very nice video I think um, puts a different spin on mobile phones and in terms of if, if you if, if you have more kind of and are more aware of the of the ethical issues and the ethics behind building these and developing these phones and where all the the, the um uh what would you call it not the ingredients but the, the 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 materials that we have to garner and extract to build mobile phones i think this is very nice while i'll show you a quick quick little video um uh, and that will be next, okay? Say hello to the new Fairphone, the phone that cares for people and planet, as well as swipes and posts. It takes great photos, even in low light. It has sleek styling, full day battery life for your very full days, dual SIM, and a unique modular design that's easy to repair in case you. Oops! This is a phone that is built to last, but what really matters is how it's made. The new Fairphone uses fair materials, like Fairtrade Gold. It's made with recycled plastics, and we strive for fair conditions for the workers. This is what you support when you own a Fairphone. Because in a world that doesn't seem to care, caring is the most radical thing you can do. The new Fairphone. Out now. That video is quite interesting. Um, very short one, but if you're if you're interested, in that's a lot more links online. So the fair phone is what to have a look at. Uh, so we have some some of the references there that I I, I would have used in to, to bring some of that material together. Uh, so other than that, um, sorry, other than that, thanks for listening and uh, goodbye. And we will I'll talk to you again in part two. Hi all, and welcome back to the second part of our introduction to Android. Um, so. Uh, in the first half, we looked at the first part. Sorry, should I say we looked at uh, background and history, some of the latest features, and then like a little comparison and uh, kind of some nice facts and figures about um, uh, the, the the comparisons of uh, kind of Android and, and iOS, right? So in today's section, what I want to look at, as I said, is um, the the finer details. So a little bit more under the hood and the kind of the structure um, and the Android framework itself. In terms of setting up the environment, what you kind of need, where you can find it, the kind of setup that I that I have myself, and is kind of tied to the lab, so that you can kind of have something similar. 
and then we finish off with again a kind of a similar comparison um but this time again just comparing the actual apps themselves and uh, and how we um how, how developers uh, kind of and the comparisons of writing apps um uh, developing the apps the play store versus the app store and if some again if some some facts and figures there as well okay so to begin with um, if we look at the so the first part of the finer details, the uh, the Android platform itself is a comprehensive platform, right? It's a complete software stack, as you can see there in in, in the, the the kind of diagram there. Okay, so that's um, kind of a graphic. We, we we will come back to this in more detail in, in later sections, but this is just a, a kind of a first look at. Um, how the, the structure of the Android operating system. Okay, so you can see there are a couple of, a number of different layers. Um, good point to note: this is it's open source, right? So anyone is is free to use it, right? By the Linux kernel, like uh, uh, any other developer, any other manufacturer for that matter, can um, customize that um, uh, the operating system and kind of make it their own. And, and there's a, a site called the AOSP, the Android Open Source Project, right? That if you wanted to yourself to get a version of Android, that's where you could go. You could download it, and then you could actually flash it to to a device, and 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 you could up up uh, update your own device with that uh, that kind of that latest version of Android as well. Okay, um, in terms of the SDK, or in terms of development from a, again a developer's point of view, all you need the SDK is all you need, right? Um, so w we will be talking about Android Studio in a minute, but even to, to, to write Android apps, you don't actually need a physical device. OK, there's a, a they've improved it greatly over the last number of years, whereby um, you have an emulator that you configure, you set up, which can mirror or mimic a particular um, actual device. And that w is what um, uh, gets launched. And that's where your app gets installed. Uh, from a development point of view. So again, uh, even though you, you, if you want to be an Android developer, you don't need an Android device to be an Android developer. Okay. I suppose the last point there, manufacturers can also customize the platform in substantial ways, even generating complete forks of the original project. And that's what Amazon has done. I, I kind of refer back to Amazon now in, in, in a few other slides as well. Okay. Um, uh, so to continue on about the finer details with this thing, uh, this notion of the CTS or the compatibility test suite, right? It, uh, it defines what it what it means to be an Android compatible device. So, basically, as a developer, right, um, uh, and a kind of manufacturer for that matter, matter I suppose, you can log on to the site. There, have the address down there. Just highlight it for you there, right? You can log on here. You can download that compatibility test suite. And basically, what it is, it's a combination of automated tests, um, as well as a document that specifies, <coughs> excuse me, what an Android device must have should have or what features are simply optional right the goal of cts is to ensure that for a regular consumer an average app from the mar market will run on an average android device if that device claims to be supporting a certain version of android and we talked about this this android versions um in the previous section on the, the kind of the api levels so what they're saying there is if you if your device has android 6 or android 7 right you can test the device and kind of run it through the, the the CTS the compatibility test suite to 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 ensure that that particular device could run a particular version of Android for argument's sake as I said version six okay um and and uh, again all free all available to download okay and just a little graphic on the side there, how how to use the CTS there you download it you run it runs you test it on the devices the results come back and that'll tell you whether or not it kind of it, it meets the requirements of of of, um, uh, of of what's required within within the CTS okay now why I suppose sorry before I move on to why um, this compatibility is actually optional it's not a requirement for any manufacturers to run their devices and their version of Android through this compatibility test suite okay um, and, and just a couple of points there it has been completely avoided by Amazon with the Kindle Fire and phone series of devices which are built on top of the Android OS and even <clears throat> myself I have an Android uh, uh, sorry um, an Amazon Fire Stick right and I have been able to install Android apps APK files on the Amazon Fire Stick even though it's not an Android device per se okay um, so even though they haven't run it through this compatibility test suite there's a really good chance that if you have an Amazon device if you um, install an Android app there's a good chance it's going to uh, it, it will um, 
it'll install okay, right? Again, to the last couple of points there, the manufacturers, they don't need to adhere to this CTS. Anyone is welcome to download and remix um, Android in any way they see fit, even yourself. Like I said, you could log on to the AOSP, you could download a version of Android, and you can just push it onto to your own device, um, kind of uh, up and, and update that version of Android that you have, okay? Uh, last point there, Android has been customized for everything from cars to satellites and from phot photocopiers to washing machines. So it's very pervasive at the moment. Android is, is <coughs> excuse me, is like, is, is nearly everywhere. Um, and in a lot of, the <coughs> excuse me, and a lot of the devices um, that you'd be, um, that you're using, okay? So, <coughs> um, why, uh, why compatibility? Right, and this is the main thing. It's because of the Google Play services, and we will come back to this in um, in, in later uh, uh, slides and later sections, okay? But if you want to be able to hook into all those Google-powered features, like the maps, like your Google Places, the um, authentication, signing in, even working with uh, Firebase, I don't know if you've heard of Firebase, but it's 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 Google's kind of back-end service, um, kind of cloud-based service okay if you want to hook into any of those and, and, and be able to um, make use of those features you need to have google play services uh, on your um, as part of your your application and that will only work obviously if this if uh, if your phone is an uh, or your device can support android okay uh, what it does do as well as the, the, the um, uh, allowing you to access to all those t cool features um, uh, that uh, Google supply you through the Google Play services, it makes it faster for phones to receive updates and easier for developers to integrate some of the new features into their app. So because all this is done silently in the background, the the um, your the, the version of Google, the Google Play service that you will have on your device will generally be pretty up to date, which allows then you as a developer to develop and make use of those latest features that Google are offering. Um, uh, so again, it's all, all kind of tied in and that's why uh, it's it's useful for to, for um, manufacturers and uh, the, the kind of distributors of the um, uh, Android itself to check to see is it compatible? Because if it is, it can run Google Play services, which then in turn gives you access to all the Google, the, the Google stuff, okay? Uh, now, uh, what I, I like to call it there, the, the developer's toolbox, so we're kind of looking at specifically what is available to you um, as a developer when developing Android apps. Um, a lot of these kind of widgets um, and and uh, features, I suppose, you'll be familiar with already, uh, or well, if you've done any kind of UI development at all, okay? Uh, so we just, I've, I've kind of broken it down into two sections. First of all, they're kind of the standard stuff. So you have all your IO widgets, your buttons, your text boxes, um, images, 2D, 3D drawings, there's action bars there. These things called view pagers that you kind of swipe back and forth. These, um, uh, an app drawer, really nice feature. You probably, if you, if you use um, uh, Gmail on your Android app, or any, any, I suppose even, could be iOS for that matter, you'll be familiar with that, this notion of an app drawer that can, it can slide in and slide out you can um uh, through android studio you can build those type of apps and it, and it takes you through uh, wizards and, and kind of gives you a starting and this boilerplate code for all those different types of applications okay another common feature in there as well is database so we, we kind of we could look at um uh, or you could look at uh, sqlite or realm as a kind of a later um uh, more kind of um, modern version of how to get at that there's another um, even later edition again part of Android X called Room um, and that if, if you're looking to, to kind of develop as um, the, the most kind of current set of features that Room would be wor worth looking at okay but again that's just kind of some of the standard stuff okay um, and again all available to you within Android Studio in a kind of a nice lovely design view and a, and a whizzy wig of what you see is what you get and you can drag out your widgets and your buttons and your your um you can as I said you can use Android Studio to set up an application with a nav drawer or with a view page or, or, or whatever okay some of the the more advanced um features um that you can avail of uh, as we kind of briefly touched on there, that you have your Google Maps, you can use Google Sign In, Firebase, as I talked about. There's all the hardware stuff in your APIs, um, working with your GPS, your accelerometers, uh, your Bluetooth, your camera. Um, there's uh, in, in terms of finding location, does that does a um, the API is called is the Fused Location Provider again, very nice. Um, uh, 
uh, kind of element to uh, Android and the APK because it's it's been improved over the years. So it, it is very, very straightforward to be able to make and develop an app that's location aware and be able to tra uh, track your uh, user's location, okay? Uh, some other stuff there dealing with um, um, kind of behind, under the scenes again, there's managed by Art or the Android runtime. So that's how your code is actually compiled and how it's pushed onto, uh, how an APK is created and then how it's, it's, it's um, pushed up to the Play Store, how it's downloaded and installed. We have things like background services. Again, depending on what l level of um, uh, Android you're you're getting into, you may or may not be covering this kind of stuff. But it's all to do with, as I said, background services. If you want to, if you need to to connect to a cloud service, and if you need to download some data or download a video or download some audio or whatever the, the case may be you might you would be using things like a sync task or this other library called volley and there's another one there called retrofit which is very a very nice library as well to allow for that kind of um that kind of uh, process uh we also have there these this inter-process communications we'll be looking at that again later on things called intense essentially how we pass messages and data between different parts of our app okay um uh, and uh, an important point to note there is the last one there's no difference between third party and native apps okay so if you are considering writing and developing an app that uses uh, may you need a calendar that may need to use the camera or whatever you don't have to go off and write a whole section that will deal with the camera and a whole section that will um, display a, a kind of a calendar type grid to the user and then and you have to code and, and, and I'll put all the logic behind it. You can literally use two lines of code to launch the camera on the device or launch the calendar and then hook into that, hook, hook into the, the device's calendar, the device's um, camera, all those stock apps that are there, you have access to that through these things called intent. So again, just kind of bear that in mind when you're considering what type of, of an app you um, uh, you might want to develop, okay? Um, now, a little bit about, kind of touched on this already, but just to, to look at it in a bit more um, uh, completely. Uh, your the, the Android application itself, right? Uh, so what happens with the installation? Okay, so Android apps, um, they get distributed in a .apk file, okay, and that's kind of short for Android package. And that is basically an archive or a zip file of, of, of your whole app, all your resources, all your code, all, all your compiled code and all the rest of it. In general, what the APK consists of is the following. A manifest file, uh, which is basically an XML file with, with a lot of metadata about your app in terms of like things like permissions, the version number, um, uh, what what screens are allowed uh, be loaded and not be loaded. But again, we will come back to that and we will cover that quite regularly through the, through the, the rest of the section. Uh, the rest of the, the, the module um, a resource bundle containing sounds graphics etc all the resources and then the actual art or the android runtime bytecodes that make up your application it's like like a dot exe for all intents and purposes if you're familiar with your windows and a dot exe um, or an, an ios it's a, a, a pad pkg that's what um that's what gets installed on the android device and that's what the user when when they install it that's what uh, they run okay now in terms of getting started right uh, basically, you could do some of this um, and, and, and build it up yourself, okay, where you might install a separate IDE and you might install, you have your separate uh, um, uh, JDK and, <coughs> excuse me, and the, the download the Android SDK and all the rest of it. I would definitely recommend going and visiting androidstudio.com slash studio, which is an, a one-stop shop for installing Android okay and installing android studio which will allow you then to develop okay so once you install that all i would say is as i have it in the, the point there just confirm your sdk with mine which is on the next slide as regards to any solutions that i, I make available to you so just just to make sure that if you download some of my solutions you have uh, the same similar version so that when you might extract my application um and and the project it'll <clears throat> it'll run okay and you won't be missing anything right but that that that's I would definitely recommend um, uh, installing that. Now, just I suppose while I'm there, one point to note, right? If you do plan on using your own device as an emulator, which you can, right? Uh, as, I, as I previously mentioned, Android Studio will uh, give you uh, the option to create your own emulator, um, which is that a virtual device, an AVD as it's called. 
but you can actually plug in with a USB your own um, Android device and uh, it should if it's a relatively new phone um, and you've and even more importantly if you've already connected your device to your laptop or whatever you plan on working on um, the device drivers will have been installed already most of them it'll pick it up automatically if it doesn't you may have to go to your uh, phone's manufacturer website and download the specific drivers for your machine but that that only happens in rare rare, rare situations most of the time you can plug in your device and off you go okay and again that's going to be the fastest emulator you ever have is your actual device okay um, but as i said to look at my the, what, what i have installed myself so at the moment this is the, this is the setup you can see it there i've got android um 10 and uh, 9 installed and uh, and uh uh, as as far as I know, I have all the versions and all the solutions that I have. Um, I will make available to you. Um, are either in nine or ten. So, if you make sure that you have Android nine and ten installed on your particular system, you will be able to download my solutions and open them up without any trouble. Okay. Um, now, obviously, if 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 uh, you have kind of different versions. It's not a huge problem. You'll just be prompted to say, oh, the SDK is missing and it'll tell you what it is and you can download it and off you go. So the, the first thing just to, to check would be that one there will be the, the SDK um, version we want. So Android, as I said, uh, nine or 10. In terms of the tools, always make sure that you have the latest build tools as I have there at the moment. That's, the, as I say, at the time of writing, okay? And I've just highlighted the last one there. Um, you can see the other ones ticked Android emulator, the SDK platform tools and all the rest of it. So again, anytime Android Studio prompts you to say oh, an update is available, I would I would generally take it. Okay. Um but the the one I have the bottom one I have highlighted there, right? Just here, just to show it for you there again. Okay. The Google Play services. If even if you don't plan on working with Google Play services at the moment, there's no harm in having it downloaded because then it will pick up when there's updates available okay but if you want to be able to have any of that um uh google sign in google maps and um, be able to use any other stuff you will need to have the uh, the google play services installed but look it's essentially taking a box okay um so that's that's the setup there for me okay now just a little comparison of android apps versus iphone apps okay <coughs> um so in terms of installing Right, so for generic on the market apps, right, the Play Store uh, originally the App Store would have been bigger, but at the moment the Play Store has uh, the larger selection by about forty percent. So that's a, it's quite a big big difference there. But obviously we're talking in the millions here, right? Um, uh, and but the App Store again still trying to catch up. Okay, so that's kind of for ge your generic for available to the consumers on 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 the Play Store on the App Store or whatever. Okay. Um, for in-house development so if you're doing it for corporate apps so we say you, you you want to just develop an app for the company that you're working on and you want to be able to just make it available in-house for you for for your own um uh, your work colleagues or management or whatever okay your the iphone apps can uh, uh only or generally mostly be installed via the app store so so that requires you to submit the app to the, the app store itself get it approved um, even for apps that are your are for your own company, you can get around it using things like test flight, or you can jailbreak the phone, which kind of might void warranties and all the rest of it. Okay, so in term, even if you don't want to go, this is not going to the public. You don't even if you don't want to uh, make it available um, outside your company. If you want it available inside the company, you still have to um, push it up onto onto the app store. Whereas with an Android app, again, push up onto Google Play. So kind of no difference there. Um, kind of comparable um, um, uh, 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 app stores you can use the Amazon uh, app store as well if you wanted as I said could actually have your Android apps um, available there and, it, and a lot of the time they'll install but here's the the, the, the big plus you every t as I mentioned there or, or previously if if and when you're developing and you want to use your device and you plug in your device with a USB when you run the app right the APK gets installed on your device, so you have to. You can then unplug that and use the app as if it had been installed from the Play Store. Likewise with email, you could physically take that APK file. You could email it to um, the, the whole company. You could even put it up uh, as a download file available on um, uh, on your 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 intranet or your corporate website. 
And if you have an Android device and you download that file and it's got a .apk extension, it will pick up the fact that it is a, an, an Android app and will take you through the install process. So you don't have to go near the Play Store at all, okay? Um, uh, whereas with, with iPhone, iOS, um, you, you would have to, okay? In terms of languages, right, uh, with your iPhone, your iOS, it's pr pr primarily Objective-C, right, which is similar to, but not exactly like C++, again, which is kind of a tricky language. So there's virtually no corporate presence for Objective-C other than for mobile apps, okay? Now, saying that, Swift is becoming a more popular language w within the iOS world, okay? Um, but again, it's it, it's it's easier to learn, but it's not as, as easy, okay? Whereas with Android, up to a couple of years ago, right, um, uh, with the advent of Kotlin, right, it was Java all the way. And that's the single most widely used language inside corporations, okay? If you want it, you could do stuff in C and C++ if you want to do some, some native uh, development, okay? Um, but again, can get tricky enough, but it's available, right? And and um, as I just mentioned there, Kotlin is becoming the language of choice now because it's got first-class support from Google. And that happened back in 2017, okay? Um, and it's just growing and growing. And the great thing is you can actually mix and match your Java and your Kotlin. So you don't have to bin all that Java code um, if you've been developing it already. You can actually just uh, kind of add to it. All you need to make sure is that you keep them in separate files. Okay, you can't you can't mix the code, but you can mix the classes as they are the resultant class that is generated from be it your dot 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 Java file or your dot KT file. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of uh, operating systems, I thought this one was quite interesting. Unfortunately, the, 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 the most recent figures I could find, you can see it up there, just for this graphic, right, was 2017. But saying that, I don't think it's changed that much since there, right, if, 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 you, if you kind of walk through the graphic, right. If you look at it there, um, uh, to be able to develop for iOS versus develop for Android, right, you need a Mac right um be it a macbook be it an imac whatever has to be one of those machines running xcode to um uh, uh, write uh, native um, ios apps okay whereas with android anything with java and android studio so you can still use a mac but you can use pc you could use linux space linux space machines uh solar space machines whatever right and if we look at it there look at the, the in terms of the percentages i know it's 2017 but still over 90% of the world's um, uh, kind of operating systems for development um, are running uh, Windows, okay? So the issue is not so much which is cooler and which you personally prefer, but rather which is already installed in corporate environments. So if you think about it, we say open your company and you have a kind of a development team, it could be say, say 30 or 40 on the development team, and you've decided now, do you know what, now let's get into mobile development. You, you can either one decide to go with the the iOS route and go off and buy a heap of Macs worth a couple of grand each then have to get your licenses um, uh, in for installing Xcode and then becoming a developer and then pushing up onto the Play Store to shift it or you can kind of go on all your Windows machines do you know what let's, on, let's install for free Android Studio and let's um, pay I think it could be 20 30 dollars as a developer to get it up onto the Play Store so this the, the, the from a, 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 an economic point of view um, it's way cheaper if you want to get into Android development versus iOS development from from a corporate perspective okay now this is a, a slightly different graph which I came across I thought was, this is quite interesting too if we look at it here this is the operating system market share worldwide okay so this is just operating systems that are used not just for development just the OS's that are on devices out there okay and if we look at this here right you can see that Android nearly 40% there is actually ahead of Windows right and then we have iOS there in third place on 14% so some some uh, Android has actually passed Windows in terms of the number of devices out there that um, uh, are, are that are operate that are being used, and they're the operating systems running on those particular devices. And again, I thought that was quite interesting. Okay, um, I think a couple more there. No, actually, sorry, um, we have some other issues to talk about there as well. Our phone features, um, the quality of those apps, customer loyalty and coolness factors. Right, again, it's slightly American, but the no this notion of customer loyalty is a big one with iPhone that people. Um, even when when the iPhone um, iPhone X came out and you were talking maybe 12, 13, 
1400 like 1400 1500 euro for a phone right users ditched their previous phone and flocked to buy these new phones okay um so that 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 is that that is the brand and that is that customer loyalty which is quite quite um very strong in the ios world okay um, another issue to kind of just bear in mind would be market presence based on your sales and your app downloads and again we kind of would have looked at that information and those some of those statistics back in part one okay um bottom line um in terms of uh, as far as i see it anyway in terms of android versus ios right so kind of broken into two which to use personally right iphone has has a smaller app store but has more loyal users right android is a lot more open <clears throat> and growing more rapidly but for me personally there's no clear winner right so it's really down to personal preferences so for me i actually prefer iphone i know it's it's a bit of a contradiction but personally myself i prefer the 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 um uh iphone okay um because uh, i'm working with macs and working with ipads and, and what have you okay but which to use for in-house apps very different story our iphone apps are very hard restrictive to install whereas android is very very simple our iPhone uses Objective C, but again, Swift is on on the up. And then Android uses Java and Kotlin, and Kotlin is very similar to Java. So if you know Java, you're going to pick up Kotlin um, uh, quite quite easily. So from that perspective, in my opinion, Android is definitely the clear winner. Okay. Uh, just some references for you. Okay. Uh, most of those again, a couple of diagrams um, kind of linked there. But uh, if if you, if you have the time, you could maybe kind of access some of those and get uh, delve a little bit deeper into the articles that I would have tried to collate for you. Um, so other than that, uh, I think that's about it. So yeah, thanks for listening and uh, goodbye. Hello all. Um, so this is just a first look at our um, the first lab we've done. It's a quick run through. Um, it's basically just to kind of get you off the ground and make sure everything is installed correctly, everything's working correctly, and does. Um, introduce some some of the basic some very basic um, kind of event handling and working with um, uh, layouts and the XML and, and so on and so forth and as we work through the semester and the weeks hopefully you will kind of get more familiar with um, Android Studio so this lab is, is basically a cut and paste exercise and then you follow the lab bring in what's required run it and then hopefully you can kind of start building on that and kind of experimenting with it um, uh, through through the rest of the labs. Okay, so if we a quick look at the, the, the app running itself, not a huge amount going on, just we just show you some of the stuff here. We have um, a simple um, a text view, just displaying um, a message to the user. We have a simple button, so kind of two widgets on our layout, that's all, um, not the next to, to, be, to begin with. And if we click on our show greeting, Sure, that's right. There we go. Little toast pops up. See down here, greetings one and all from Android. And again, if I do it a couple of times, we can just, so and just to highlight it there for you. So there it is, popping up for you. Again, nothing fantastic, but does demonstrate um, event handling uh, in an Android app. So to briefly run through the code itself. So if we look at our, 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 um, our main activity, okay. So here we have it here we have i suppose the points to note our main one there there's our on create um which is the, that one of the the methods in the uh, in the life cycle that we we definitely need to have all uh, the rest of them are optional we have this method called set content view which if you see the parameter that's getting passed in is a reference to a layout and right? that r we'll talk about this in more detail but just kind of quickly as we're on the, the subject this r reference is a, a java class that has physical references ids to integer values to every resource that's part of uh, your application so in this case it's actually because there's so many in there um, we have we can say our r and then reference it via a layout and then the actual layout itself activity underscore main and if you look at that over here in our layout package which corresponds to that layout we have there's our activity underscore main dot xml and that's what you're referencing here so what that method does there is inflate this layout over here so all this here that's what that does now at the moment obviously we've only got two widgets but that's that's what send content view will do um, and on top of that it then allows you through cotton extensions to reference a particular or any number of widgets on uh, on on your on your layer. So here we have a greeting. Uh, a, a, we have a reference to this variable, um, this object greeting button. That's this object here. That's our button greeting button. And if we quickly, just while we're on this object, I guess, if we quickly look at our layout. So if we open up our activity.xml, 
and look at the text right you can see it there there's our button widget the xml version of it and there's the important bit for us the id and it's called greeting button so because of cotton extensions we can directly access that widget which is in our layout from our code inside our activity and that's like a, a, a nice addition or a nice kind of improvement on, uh, on on what you would have to do in java and you'd have to a thing called find view by id you have to go off and find that and all the rest of it so getting back to our code sorry back to our main activity so all we're doing here is here is a very uh, simple way to add event handling and add a listener to your um, object so here we're saying our greeting button dot set on click listener and then we pass in to note the the, um, uh, the function body we initially say a reference we say create a variable val um, greeting text is assigned and there's an, a, a, um, another kind of uh, android function get string which refers to here's another resource but this time it's a string resource r dot string and it's that greeting underscore text right um, and if we again just to show you if we open up our strings.xml which is where all the resources are and if you see it here there's our greeting text and if you look at the value of it there it is greetings one and all from android so what we're saying back here in our main if i just show you again in our main.xml here is we're saying a retrieve from our uh, our string resource from our strings.xml the variable or the string resource greeting underscore text and assign our greeting text property here the value of whatever that happens to be and that's what we then pass into our little toast and that's what gets triggered so if i show you again over here we show greeting that's the message that gets displayed to the user there's not a huge amount else going on there um i suppose just just kind of be become familiar with the whole structure and all the different folders and packages within your application so we have our inside our java um, we have our code in this case obviously it's, it's cotton so uh, we have our main activity With this we have some testing going on here and uh, some other packages we won't be kind of using that as such then we have our res folder and within that we have a drawable folder which where we can put all different kind of drawable assets that we wanted to maybe display to the user all your layouts will go in here um mip maps is would be where uh, if you have any particular images so we can look just expand it for you while we're at it right there's your we have our launcher icon so you can see it here right uh, all the different versions see HTPI, mid mid x the different resolutions close that down and then another one you'll be using quite often is your values okay so in there we have our colors our strings and our styles the one you will use probably most often is your strings so if your string resources but as i ask you to do in the exercise i can actually do it here now if you want if you go into our colors and you can see it here there's all the different colors so if we wanted to we could actually change the toolbar color which is our color primary so if we can we can select that and if we want just to show you we'll drag that back a little bit um here we go back there again actually we have, or we can use some predefined colors down here ones that we've been using previously and if we do okay you can see it change there now and if i then go up and if i run that app again it says just building up give it a second there's a great little build running we sit down on the bottom launching there we go and give it a second and there you go so you can see how how quickly and easily it is to change the colors um within your your, your application um that's it basically uh does not huge amount more to, to that we need to discuss in this one is very as i said it's basically to get you off the ground um if you can if you can complete this this lab and um uh, run the app uh, it kind of confirms to yourself that yes you have this the the, the, the correct setup you have the, the the proper libraries installed and you, we can then we can progress on with the, the other applications okay and the other lab so um thanks for listening and uh, goodbye hello everyone uh, so here we have just a quick look at our first version of placemark uh, it doesn't do too much um, because it's basically the, 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 the default setup um, but we do bring in the anchor logger and a bit of logging so and um, we can see um, uh, kind of how that, how that operates and then you can kind of use that later on yourselves in your own um, uh, uh, project and assignment so <clears throat> what we'll have a quick look at just to run through the, 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 the classes we have our over here we have our placemark activity um, we have our associated layout then we have our colors and our strings and our styles 
And if you see here, we just show you if we open up our strings.xml, um, we just have the, the application uh, name itself simply place mark. We have um, the default colors, which we, if you need to, you can change here. Let's just show them there now. You can highlight them there. So if you were to select one of those, get a little picker. Sorry, just double click on it there, Nafia. Give it a second to load up. There we go. Um, so if, as I said, if you wanted, you could just change it there. Um, and or if you know the hexadecimal value you want yourself, you can actually replace it there like so. But if we just go back and we simply run this, so again, we are running it up here. So we're this this is our kind of our options here for building, for um, stopping or rerunning. So if we choose one there for the moment, I just stop it. And so we can see it over here that it has cancelled it out on the um, the app, the, the device itself. And if we go back over here, here's our, our play or run button. Okay. So if we simply run that, hit play, you'll see it down here. That it would have launched there, but it happened so quick, actually, you may have missed it, but we'll load up there. And all we get is the default. Our hello world message been displayed hard, hard coded values. Um, and what we're just concerned about is if we go back to our placemark activity code, and it's this here. So we've hard coded in this message, just placemark activity started. So we just want to confirm that that has been displayed in the log cat, which is uh, down here. So if you can see it there, your log cat tab. So I will just uh, select that, load it up, and you can see yourself as a a lot of stuff in there if i just I'll, I'll, I'll drag up that window a little bit for you so you can see there's quite a lot in here if I just and all that's just been generated from this the that um s very simple basic app so what we can do is we can filter it out we can type in place mark okay and then if we see it there if we just look down through it there's our our particular message place mark activity started so that just confirms yes that the on creator was called correctly and um uh we can I just again just show you kind of the dates and the times and all the rest of it there so it's punched in there and uh obviously coupled with a lot of other stuff so if we cancel that again there we are we're back to all those messages all those lock cats and there's a lot, a lot of information in there um most of it we don't need to be our concerns ourselves about um, so we can filter right there. We can actually, and we may do this in later um, uh, uh, apps, in la later labs, should I say. We can actually create our own little filter as well, but we leave that for another day. So just uh, all this lab does is when we run it, we get the basic screen popping up, which is over here. And just have our hello world. And it was the title with a particular color. And when we filter it, just show you again, Just confirm that you get your message been displayed in uh, the log cat okay um that's about it really so uh hopefully you got that working and we will uh, look at some more features and, and add some more to this application in the next lab okay so thanks for listening and uh, goodbye